Well, I guess it's good afternoon now, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm sensing a little interest in IOL calculations. What do you think? Um, my name is Doug Koch, and I'm uh, delighted to be here to moderate this session sponsored by Hogstrite on new advances and new solutions for IOL calculations. And we have a fantastic group of speakers and panelists. Um, so uh, Warren Hill, Mike Snyder, Steve Scoper, and Adi Abalafia, uh, each of whom um, has done important work to advance what we're doing. Uh, so I think without further ado, I'd like to first begin with uh, Warren Hill. I think, as you know, uh, Warren has developed uh, the Hill RBF formula coming from a completely different direction and uh, offering something that I think has been a huge contribution to our clinical practice. And Warren is going to talk to us about the formula, how it evolved, and give us a little more feeling of, of not only what it can do now, but because of its sort of self-validating and its also a, ability to be expanded where it can take us in the future. So, Warren. Thank you, Doug, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Wow, it's, uh, it used to be that uh, talking about lens power calculations during lunch was like a death sentence. And uh, it's, it's amazing how all of us have grown to see uh, cataract surgery and lens-based surgery in, entirely uh, almost as a, in, a refractive procedure now, and um, the number of you in the room uh, represents that. Okay, so this is a brand new method, as Doug mentioned, for doing IOL power calculations. And um, it doesn't use virgin's formulas. It's coming at the problem from a completely different point of view. And as such, it's not encumbered by some of the problems that we've had in the past. Now, most importantly, this is a worldwide collaborative effort. This is not the work of one person. This has been a joint project with Hogstrite over the last seven years. In fact, everybody at this podium has been involved in the, the evolution of this project. This is 27 surgeons in 14 countries in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, North and South America, Asia, India, and Australia. So again, it's a worldwide collaborative effort, and as Doug mentioned, it's constantly expanding and constantly evolving. Now, whenever we do something new, everybody wants to know, you know, what did you do and how do you do it? But I think more importantly is why did we do this? And I think all of us in this room are committed to increasing patient safety and physician confidence and reducing the burdens associated with a refractive surprise. Now, how we did this was we successfully borrowed and adapted two um, aspects of an already well-established calculation method within the engineering community and applied it to ophthalmology. There are often not a lot of original ideas, but there are original applications to how we can do things. And what we came up with was a self-validating continuously improving IOL power selection method that's free of virgin's formulas and the limitations of the effective lens position. Now, whenever we go in the operating room, that elephant in the room that's with us is IOL power selection. This always plays in the background, and it isn't until that second or third visit that we get an idea of how well did we do at this, at this process. So what's the typical half diopter accuracy for us as surgeons? And if you look at four well-known studies, uh, the Hahn study, um, the Glenn Gale study for the National Health Service in the United Kingdom, the Swedish registry study, and the Haggis formula optimization study, you see basically that nobody's getting it right all the time. The Haggis formula optimization study um, that I oversaw is, a, is more than a quarter million cases, and even after the removal of outliers and the optimization of lens constants, half diopter accuracy is still about 78%. So this is the gap that we need to close. If we drill down deeper in this very large database, less than 1% of surgeons are at 92% or better. 6% of surgeons are at 84%, and the vast majority of people are at 78. I have some good news for all of you today. We can move almost everybody in this group up to that first column with a couple of changes in how you do things. So this is huge. This is what 78% accuracy looks like represented graphically. And so we need to do better if we're going to be putting in multifocals and torics. The calculation methods that we use right now are basically virgin's formulas. And we all have our, our favorite way of doing things, maybe depending on axial length. There's still some people using SRK2. The majority of us are using virgin's formulas. There's uh, ray tracing with uh, Thomas Olson's formula. And then, of course, there's this new method based on artificial intelligence. This is from an ASCRS survey, and you can see that the majority of surgeons choose a formula based on axial length. 
Here's the formula you're using. This is from uh, Frederick Gauss from 1840. It's the first half of the 19th century. And if we fast forward to right now, you'll see that this formula and this formula, which is the mathematical backbone for all the virgins formulas, are very much the same. We've added the effective lens position, keratometry, a few other things, vertex distance, but pretty much we're still using a virgins formula from the first half of the 19th century. Now, the interesting thing is the power of the intraocular lens inside the eye is relative, not absolute. So a 21 diopter lens inside the eye is only 21 diopters, a set distance from the cornea, and that we call the effective lens position. If that lens moves posterior or anterior or set another way, if the anatomy of the eye and the assumptions of the formula are different, what we get is a refractive surprise. So a lot of people would think, well, if I have a shallow anterior chamber, the lens is going to sit more anterior. Well, here's a, here's a plot of anterior chamber depth against axial length. And we're going to take a look at the effective lens position at a schematic eye parameter, 23 and a half millimeters. I had absolutely no trouble finding 40 eyes where the effective lens position didn't correlate with the preoperative anterior chamber depth in any way whatsoever. It, they, these were all 5.5 millimeters. So, our ability to correctly determine the effective lens position, which also determines the total optical power of the eye, you know, has a lot of limitations. And one of the purposes of this, this approach was to get rid of that limitation. So here's the database on the RBF method that we're currently using. There's the half diopter accuracy. This is SRKT. These are all the cases that are outside half diopter accuracy for about 3,400 cases. Here's that same database, and here's half diopter accuracy, and these are the cases that are outside half diopter accuracy with this new method, and I'll show you how we did that. So how comfortable are we with making change? You know, we as surgeons, we're very, very reluctant to change for fear we're going to experience something unanticipated. And for us to dump something that we've used for 40 years in, in place and replace it with something else requires that several criteria be fulfilled. It has to have an advantage. It has to be compatible with what we knew and what, what we know and what we do. It has to not be so complex that we can't use it. And we have to be able to trial it and make sure that it lives up to its promises. And we have to observe these improvements in a way that we believe them and we can incorporate them. This is an example of a game-changing technology. When the iPhone first came out, I thought it was the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. Why would a computer company make a telephone? I mean, I, have, I had a Nokia phone. I thought it was great. What does Apple know about this? Well, they weren't making a phone. They were making something different. And it was a completely different idea. And my father used to say that the, the, there's nothing more powerful than a good idea. And that's what I think we have right now. So looking at different groups who are willing to change what they're doing, a man named Everett Rogers wrote a book called The Diffusion of Innovations. And if you don't know his book, you know his vocabulary because we use it every day in our conversations. What Everett Rogers says is that within any group of, of people looking to adopt a technology, there are different subsets. And any one of us can be in any one of these groups depending on the technology and where we are in our thinking. So they're the early adapters, the people that stand in line eight hours to get an iPhone because they want to have it and they believe in it. There's the early majority, people who try it only after someone else tries it. There's the late majority, people who are kind of inherently cynical and follow established norms, kind of like that uh, approval nurse for the HMO that you're working with that can't spell vitrectomy. And um, they're the laggards. These are the people that have an iPhone only because rotary phones aren't available. And then there are the innovators, the people like Doug Koch, that, that show us you know, what's possible and new ways of thinking. More broadly based, those people to the left are looking to enhance outcomes. And those people on the other side are looking to maintain familiarity. And my hope is that every person in this room is looking to enhance outcomes. So we're going to talk about pattern recognition and artificial intelligence, totally different than anything we've ever used in ophthalmology before. And the, the advantage of, of pattern recognition is it's adaptive learning. So what, we, what we're using is based on data only, independent of what, what was previously known. A lot of the formulas we have uh, limit situations to possibilities that we already understand. And this is self-organizing, which means it has its own ability to create its own representation of the data. And it's well suited to the task of unraveling complex 
nonlinear relationships. Think about the human eye. For an axial length of 26.5 millimeters, how many combinations of central corneal power, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, and white to white are there? It's unbelievable. That's 26.5. Now to go to, to 26.5. Five, five, how many combinations are there? It's an astronomical number. So we have a way of de dealing with this that's different than what we have before. And this is free of calculation bias. So let's, let's do a little exercise in pattern recognition. Think about how little information you have here on the screen, and yet each of us are able to figure out exactly what these represents. This is a form of pattern recognition. We can take that same simple idea and look at it differently with preoperative measurements and postoperative results, and we can turn this into a pattern. And with the scary fast computers we have and the very sophisticated software we have, we can turn these patterns into an IOL power. So here's another example. This is a, a square. It's got a 1,000 random input vectors. And these vectors were generated by something called a Manhattan distance generator. The Manhattan distance is the uh, the sum of absolute sum of Cartesian coordinates, they end up looking like little squares, like the city blocks of Manhattan. And we're going to ask an artificial intelligence algorithm to tell us the internal organization of this seemingly chaotic uh, picture. We're going to use a tool called feature extraction and feature matching, and we're going to run it through 5,000 times. And with the computers we have, this doesn't take very long. So here's 40 cycles, 120 cycles, 500 cycles. 5,000 cycles, and from this seeming chaotic mess, we were able to tell that these were Manhattan distances. So think how powerful this technology is for IOL power calculations, and you can see why we're excited about it. So you might think, well, this is pretty geeky. No one's ever heard of this before. Turns out that all of you with an iPhone in your pocket are using this right now. It's all around us. So when oil companies want to figure out how much oil they're going to get out of the ground, they use this technology. Uh, tractor companies, motorcycle companies, um, automobile manufacturers use this to calibrate their engines. When law enforcement wants to find the bad guy by facial recognition, they use, they use this technology. And tens of billions of dollars are moved around the world every day in the stock market using the pattern recognition form that, we, that we're employing here um, for predicting what the stock market's going to do. You can also use this for um, get, getting rid of noise. And EKGs, or, or rather thumbprints and fingerprints, are using this for identification. So if you have an iPhone, you have an, your American Express card um, on your iPhone, it asks you for your fingerprint. That's where this is coming from. And EKGs are now using this. And EKGs, what? It's just a pattern. And you remember, as medical students, when you were asked to figure out that crazy arrhythmia torsades de points or something unusual, you know, we had to ask our attending, you know, what that was. Now we just run it through um, a pattern recognition algorithm in the EKG machine, and it can pick up and tell us exactly what the arrhythmias are. This is, this is called T-wave alternans, and if this shows up, these patients get pacemakers and defibrillators. So we develop a calculator basically by figuring out what things are most important. We know that axial length is important, central corneal power, anterior chamber depth, but who knows? Maybe the patient's zodiac sign, mother's maiden name, favorite dessert, shoe size, you know, may come into it. So we, we, we use a genetic algorithm. It's a form of, of evolutionary model uh, development to allow us to pick out the factors that are most important. And because this isn't an, uh, a formula, things pop up that we may not expect, like the patient's age or their pre-op spherical equivalent. What we were looking for is the greatest number of cases within half a diopter for the data we use to fit the database, to fit the model, and then also an independent validation set. And we, we found that the axial length, central corner power, and anterior chamber depth for a given IOL power and post-operative results was the best for us and then also the fewest out-of-bounds points. And I'm going to go over that in just a minute and show how this is a brand new tool in ophthalmology and how it helps us to make a lot of decisions. Now, this is where things begin to get interesting. If you look at this, this is about 650 cases. We've taken a cloud of data and turned it into a straight line. This is our half diopter accuracy. And you can see that there's no calculation bias. The number of out-of-bounds points clusters only with number of cases, not axial length. So this is the first time we have something where it doesn't really matter what the axial length is. Now remember, the, the, the goal of all of us up here is patient safety and physician confidence. 
and this is one of the new tools that we're bringing to iWell Power calculations that's going to make things easier for all of us. In engineering, there's a concept called a boundary model, and a boundary model is a way of taking look, a look at pairs of data and determining what the accuracy is going to be before the calculation is done. And this is axial length against central corneal power. And mathematically, we can set these boundary models to whatever we want. This is for 90% accuracy with half a diopter. We can identify those data points that are outside the boundary model and flag the user. So for those of, us, those of you who've used this before, that's that out of bounds statement. So this is the, these are the six pairwise boundary models for the RBF version that you're currently using either on your LensStar or on the online calculator. And um, this is for 3,445 eyes. And if we do a calculation for Plano with a 26 millimeter axial length, there's that data point within that pairwise boundary model. We can add the Ks, and there are those, those um, points within those boundary models, and we can add the anterior chamber depth. And you can see that every single one of these data point, points are within the confines of a 90% accuracy pairwise boundary model. It's an inbounds calculation. So this, what, this is what it means when you get that statement. In a similar way, we're going to take the same eye, but this time we're going to have a scary shallow anterior chamber of 1.5 millimeters. Now for 26 millimeter eye, I don't have any data for a 1.5 millimeter anterior chamber depth, and you can see that some of these orange dots are outside the boundary model. It means we don't have data to support the calculation, don't use it, and that's what the out of bounds indication means. So for most regression algorithms, you're working in two dimensions. Here we're working in six, so it's a completely different approach. There's a calculator online that many of you are familiar with. This is what it looks like. If you want to read about what it is, you can hit what is this, and it'll explain it to you. And if you're as geeky as a lot of us, you can kick on this, and, and it'll take you to all the scary math, and it'll explain exactly what we're doing. You can enter the calculator, and it'll take you to something that looks just like what's on the LensStar. And through an enormous act of generosity, Hogstride has made this available not only for the LensStar, but also for other biometry methods as well. Right now, we're sampling the artificial intelligence model at Plano. The next version, you're going to be able to actually enter your de desired spherical equivalent because we're going to have more data, and Steve Sc Scoper is going to talk about that in just a minute. Right now, we're calculating for Plano, and we'll give you a one diopter range. The next version is going to be quite different. So this is an inbounds calculation, and this is an out-of-bounds calculation for the same IOL power because some of the preoperative measurements may be different. Now, again, we're very slow to change as uh, ophthalmologists, but in the first 30 weeks, we had more than 75,000 calculations just for the online calculator, and we're anticipating more than 130,000 calculations for the online calculator in the first year. This is what it looks like on the LensStar. So we have RBF, we have Barrett, and we have Olson, the three formulas that are from this century, and also formulas that have the highest amount of accuracy. Now the fun part is they're continuing updates, and this is where we are right now. We've just finished this update. Our 27 beta testers in 14 countries have sent us 12,419 cases, and you can see we have a tremendous range. In fact, we're now going down to minus five diopters and up to 30 as well. But this is sort of a, a huge range of uh, human, human anatomy here. And what I want to share with you is something that I've never seen before, and this is one of the most exciting parts about what we're doing. Um, if you look at the, this entire database and we fit it to the artificial intelligence model for the half diopter accuracy, we had no out-of-bounds cases. We were able to reproduce the outcomes for more than 12,000 cases, and the ability of the artificial intelligence model to fit this database was 98%. Now, we haven't done a prospective test on this. Steve Scoper is going to tell it, going to show us what the accuracy is like. He's the first person to use this, this new version, but this is very, very exciting. So this is where we are in, uh, in August of 2017, and this is where, gonna, where we're going to be in August of 2018. So as Doug Koch mentioned, this is continuously evolving, and um, it's very, very exciting. This next version is going to be based on 12,000 cases. Hopefully the version after that will be based on 30,000 cases. That's our goal. So 
every time we do this, we're going to expand the boundary model. And that's the goal of this, is to make the boundary model bigger and better and have a greater uh, breadth and depth for your calculations. So in my opinion, the calculation, the future of Iowa power calculations is very bright. And this is an exciting time to be an ophthalmologist because now we have the ability to be accurate in a way we couldn't be before. So this is how we started out, 78%. This is where we're going to be with the next version. And the goal of this project is nothing less than to remove the uncertainty for the calculation of the spherical equivalent for all of us. And wouldn't that be something great if you never had to have that elephant in the room come with you when we did IOL power calculations? Thank you. It's, it's really fun to see how something from outside ophthalmology has been brought in. And I think Warren, um, you, you have no idea how many hours he's spent on this and the number of uh, steps he's taken and, and the, how he's reached out to industry to develop this. It's, it's, and we have it available to us. It's pretty remarkable. And, and we do owe a lot to Hoxtrite for making it available, um, not only on their own device, which was really a critical part of the study, in fact, because most of us use that device, but to make it available to all of us. So uh, our next speaker is Mike Snyder from the C Cincinnati Eye Institute. And Mike's going to tell us about a clinical trial he's been doing with the Hill RBF formula. Mike? Thanks, Doug, and uh, thanks to Hogstripe for putting this all together and for Warren for coming up with this just absolutely brilliant idea. I'm going to be talking to you about my first year's experience with the Hill RBF calculator. And when I think about it, it's really supposed to be my experience, but as I give it a little bit of additional thought, it's really a more of a journey than an experience. And the journey starts off, with, as any journey does, by first collecting data and analyzing that data. And there's always an emotional component to any journey. So, I thought about it. When's the first word that I had of the RBF calculator? And I thought and I thought and I thought. And as things started to come clear to me, like most other iconic things, I don't remember when the first time was. But as long as I kind of understand the, the general concepts, then I feel pretty good about it. And the Hill RBF method, the three major data points for me are that it evaluates the data set and it uses pattern recognition and artificial intelligence. Now, I don't really know much about artificial intelligence. Warren is brilliant, and he can figure this stuff out in his sleep. Uh, for me, it's a little bit harder. He actually confided in me one day that the underlying math makes his teeth hurt. Well, if it makes his teeth hurt, I would be completely edentulous with no nothing. But we don't really need to know how a fuel injector works to know whether we're enjoying a ride from a fine car, and so I I'm a devout pragmatist. So I just want to know that if it's data-driven and self-validating, continuously evolving, you know, how does it work for me? And when I talk about my early experience, it really started with the beta test prospective study. This study was uh, using criteria of patients that were undergoing elective cataract surgery with pretty much healthy eyes, front and back, normal topographies, and surgery that went beautifully. All of the patients had to meet the LENSTAR validation criteria, and there are several criteria, because the calculator is validated and developed for this instrumentation. And they all had to have inbounds calculations, as Dr. Hill has just educated us about. So the results were really pretty darn impressive. Of the 467 patients that we had in this prospective study, 91% were within the half a diopter target. And when we stratified by axial length, 98% of the axial myopes, longer than 25, were within that target. Of the normal axial lengths, again, about 92% within a half a diopter. This is just unparalleled information, and this is with the first data set. Even the axial hyperopes, who are the toughest ones, 85% within the half diopter target. Now, let's compare that with what we've traditionally thought about as the go-to formulae for hyperopes of the last uh, couple decades, and it really outperformed significantly. It's not a close call. So what was my experience after the study? Incorporating the Hill RBF into my regular practice has a lot to do with it. First, we started off with manual data entry, and uh, you've seen this form before. 
But uh, mid last year, the RBF calculator online became available. And then by autumn of 2016, we actually had the RBF natively installed on the LensStar unit. And that really is a game changer from a workflow perspective because we have the printouts coming directly out of the unit and giving me all the information that I need. Now, from my workflow, maybe different from others in the room, but I always like to obtain the measurements before a consultative discussion with a cataract patient. And in fact, these are the people who obtain this information for me. These are the testing techs at Cincinnati Eye. They're a wonderful group of people. And I just want to call your attention briefly to Mary. Mary is the one who is the second one from the right. And, and why I'm calling your attention to her will be evident later. So everything always has to start with the patient, right? Everything we do starts and ends with the patient. So once they've gotten their testing, I greet the patient in the room, hi, how are you? And then I look at them at the slit lamp, examine what their uh, eye looks like. We take a look and uh, I have the lens star topography, the T-cone topography available to me. I can check for the presence and the regularity of astigmatism. And I really like to look at the Myers as well to see is this somebody who has some dry eye or perhaps a mapped out fingerprint dystrophy that I might be looking for to catch up on. And then I look at the LensStar printout. If I zoom in a little bit, there's some really interesting information that's very helpful for me talking to the patients before I've had the discussion. One is I know what their axial length is. Why is that important? Well, people with long axial lengths, as we all know, are at greater risk for retina detachment, and it's not always the myope. The axial myopes sometimes have plano or even occasionally hyperopic refractions. So knowing that information might also change how I might select an implant lens style. It's also helpful for me to know what their central corneal thickness is. Maybe they had a borderline pressure, or maybe they got a funny looking nerve. If their corneal thickness, as in this case, is very low, I know that I'm gonna have a different uh, estimation of what the accuracy of my applination tomography uh, was. And of course, once I wanna zoom in on selecting the IOL power, I first check and make sure that in fact, all of the parameters were in bounds for calculation and we select what the desired refractive outcome is for this particular patient, in this case, a 10-diopter implant. And yes, I actually do pick the IOL myself while in the examining room, studying the topography, the lens star data, the RBF, and the patient. And uh, that selection is done while I'm in that room. I actually will fill out my surgical plan while I'm in the room, and I still like to use paper for this so that I can see if there's any inadvertent uh, error or change that has occurred from the time that the paper was written and uh, from when I'm in the operating room. And then, of course, we need to take the patient to the operating room, and we need to do a good job on the surgery. This is actually a completely unedited case. I did speed it up a little bit, but you know, we have to make sure that if we're going to do all our great calculations, we still want to do a great surgery. This patient had some iris problems, too, and if we're going to think about calculations, we sure do want to make sure that their pupil is in the center underlying all of the optics which we've uh, carefully planned for. And uh, it's always nice to try and make the pupil look kind of nice, too. You can see we're using like Ahmed's technique of quadri too. And, and, and again, it begins and ends with the patient. Patient ended up with a 2020 outcome with a minus 0.75 diopter sphere, less than a quarter diopter off of the mi minus 0.52 prediction that we saw earlier. So Warren mentioned earlier that we all adopt technologies differently. And we all know, or at least we all think we know where we fall on this uh, list. Perhaps our friends might know better uh, for who, where we fall on this list. But uh, there's a significant emotional component to this. And we are all creatures of habit. And we should recognize that. So when is it the right time to give up the old method of doing something? Well, we certainly don't want to wait until we're outdated. When we look at the IOL calculation formulae that many are still using today, these are from the 1990s. That's quite a while ago. It's not this millennium anymore. Don't get me wrong, there's lots of good stuff from the 1990s. We had a lot of fun in the 1990s. But there's some stuff from the 1990s that might as well just stay in the 1990s. Remember Mary? This is what Mary looked like when two of these formulas came out, right? So while we are creatures of habit, we're also data-driven physicians. And better data means that it's time to jump and do something different. Can we do repeat personal validation? Sure. You know, it's kind of like going back to our you know, security blanket. There's nothing wrong with double-checking things, right? 
So I did that in preparation for this meeting. I said, you know, I better make sure that, that I, what I'm saying still feels good. So I just quickly took some data from one month uh, follow-ups of 51 recent consecutive healthy eyes on a premium IOL platform. Because when is it most important that we're getting these right? Well, certainly the premium IOL patients. Patient that wants to wear glasses because they feel naked without them, probably not as critical. Very critical if we're aiming to try and get them as independent from spectacles as possible. So here's the uncorrected acuities from that 50-person group. And we had essentially everybody but one that was 20, 30 or better, and the overwhelming majority even better than that. Now, do understand, some of these people we were actually aiming for minus a quarter or minus a third. So I'm one of those people I worry about the outlier, right? I think we learn a lot more from the outliers than we do from the primary individuals. So I, I went and looked up the data on this one particular patient, and it turns out that she was actually quite happy. She was at 2025 at her visit before this particular data point was collected, and she was actually within a tenth of a diopter of her expected target. She did have some dry eye, and I think that uh, that day maybe they didn't ask her to blink before checking her vision, but uh, she was a perfectly happy individual. Whenever we do an internal QIQA study, it, it's always worth doing, and, and I think that that addresses the emotional component. But 51 cases is really too small to be statistically meaningful. But it's okay to have an emotional component to things as long as it gets us to the right place. So the things that I think about are, number one, the Hill RBF is objectively superior for IOL power calculation. It just is. It's easy to incorporate into your workflow. And we have an obligation to our patients to stay up to date. And I'd submit to you that we actually have an obligation to ourselves to stay up to date. And better yet, isn't it nice to stay ahead of the curve? The LENSTAR and the Hill RBF calculator really provide us the tools to do just that. Thanks very much for your attention. Thanks, Mike. And um, I think, again, that one of the points you make is the quality of the data going in. And one of the things that Warren has talked about and a lot of us talk about is validating your data and having a biometer that allows you to do that and check it uh, is a critical aspect of that. Well, somebody who's uh, pretty up to date with his formulas is Steve Scoper. And Steve's going to talk to us about the latest formulas and how they compare. Steve? Thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you guys uh, today at, uh, at lunch. I'm going to be talking about hitting the mark and some of my experience with the uh, Hill RBF uh, method. So when you look at this panel right here, what do you really need to do to get results when you're looking at people like Doug Cope, Warren Hill, Michael Snyder, and Dr. Abdullafia? These are some great thinkers They've done such a wonderful contribution to, to ophthalmology. And it's a little intimidating for me sometimes, and so I put my picture just right down there at the bottom, just because I'm up here on, on the podium. So what do you as an audience really need? And at a meeting like this, you know, you're asking the question, do I need the Lenstar or the IOL master? Do I need a femtosecond laser or not? What about an aberometer? Should everybody's got an aberometer? I don't have an aberometer. Which topographer? There's so many topographers out there. Dr. Hill, which topographer do I need to, to buy? Do I do the Varion, the Callisto? What about posterior corneal astigmatism? Do I measure it or do I use some kind of uh, a formula? And then which IOL formula do we use? So when you start looking at all the things we, we need, I say, and I think all of you would agree with me, yikes. That's why we're at this meeting this weekend, to try to learn some of these uh, things. I like to go back to the very basics of getting good results. Let's push all of this new technology aside and think about spherical equivalent that Dr. Hill has been talking about, whose focal, a spherical, a spherical equivalent is a spherical power whose focal point coincides with the circle of least confusion of a spherocylindrical lens. You can remember this on your OCAPS exam, okay, from many years ago. The spherical equivalent is equal to the algebraic sum of the value of the sphere, half the cylindrical value. This is important because even if the astigmatism changes, the spherical equivalent will remain the same because of corneal coupling. So it has nothing to do with dealing with astigmatism. We look for good spherical equivalent on every single case that we do. So what is our goal? Our goal, as you've already heard, 
from the two previous uh, speakers is to hit our target, our spherical equivalent target, at plus or minus a half a diopter for all of our IOLs. And we need to be doing this for our monofocal IOLs before we need to be jumping into toric and multifocals and extended depth of, of, of field uh, IOLs. So we've got to get plus or minus a half a diopter. So I ask you, be thinking, what percentage of your cataract surgeries would you like to hit this goal? You've already hit, you've already seen some of the results that Dr. Hill has been talking about. How many here in the audience actually knows what percentage of your patients you hit plus or minus a half a diopter uh, for a standard monofocal IOL? You've tracked it. Kind of look around. How many hands are going up, okay? Not many. I challenge you to know what your number is, and I'll show you what my number is. Now, we know that there's four basic steps to obtaining these great spherical equivalent results. Preoperative testing, IOL calculations, the surgery itself, managing postoperative uh, variants. Today, today, we're talking about IOL calculations. And let's remember, there's just simply three different steps, the axial length, keratometry, and then the calculation formula or method. Optical biometry years ago changed everything. We remember from our residency that a one millimeter axial length error can result in a three diopter error. That doesn't happen anymore because of optical biometry. This used to be the number one problem we had with IOL calculations. That problem has completely, almost completely gone away with optical biometry. Keratometry hitting our result. We know that there's a one-to-one -one ratio in potential area error with our K readings. A one diopter error in K reading yields a one diopter error in refractive outcome. Now remember that all of the different ways we can calculate keratometer, all the different keratometers, it depends on their optical zone, and you're going to get a different uh, you're going to get a get different number because the cornea is not spherical. The, part, the cornea is prolate, which means it's steeper in the center, flatter in the periphery. So a smaller optical zone is going to have a higher K reading. So what you don't want to do is some of your patients with an IOL master, some with a lens star, some with manual keratometry, because the manual keratometry OZ zone is 3.2 millimeters and the lens star is 2.3 millimeters. Those numbers are going to be different. They're supposed to be different. So I would recommend to you to only use one method to do all of your K readings. And lastly, all the different IOL formulas are available. And Dr. Snyder just really did a good job in making us remember that a lot of these formulas were back in the 1990s. And I think if you are still a person who is getting the A constant off the box for your SRK, don't raise your hand, okay? But make a little note to yourself to stop it immediately, okay? And a lot of us uh, have been, you know, been perfectly happy with the Holiday 1 and Holiday 2. It's, it's been, there have been good workhorses, but I would ask you to look down at the bottom right of this chart and going towards Olson, Barrett, and Hill RBF formulas. That's where we need to be transitioning. You can still look at the formulas you're looking at now, but start looking at the Barrett and the Hill side by side so you can start transitioning to these uh, formulas. So let me talk about 288 retrospective uh, cases with the new expanded RBF uh, 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 method that I've had access to for just a, a few weeks. The, uh, there were 297 cases, and as Dr. Hill explained, nine out-of-bounds indications that we took away, so we looked at 288 uh, cases. You can see the IOL power range from plus 950 to plus 30, a good axial length uh, a range from 20 to almost uh, 20, uh, 28. So here are the results. You can see in the first column, we've got the groups, we've got the axial length ranges, we've got the number of uh, cases, and then we've got three different columns. The far right is the Barrett, next to the left is the original RBF, and then the newer expanded RBF. So let's first look at all cases, the average of all cases, what percentage hit plus or minus a half adopter. If you look on the far right, Barrett, 94.3%. And I'm very proud of that. I think that's a very good number. The original RBF, 91.5%, which is still very good. Expanded RBF, looking at the same results, 
uh, percent, approaching 95 percent accuracy, or plus or minus a half a diopter. Now we all know that the short eyes those are the ones we get crazy results. So any of you know that if you've got a patient with an axial length that's shorter than 22.5 diopters, those numbers can go all over the place. So look at the Barrett on the far right, 87.4%. That's a pretty good number. The original RBF, 83.3%. And look at the expanded RBF. It went from 83 to 88.5%. So for short eyes, just looking at 87 uh, short eyes, I'm very pleased with that result. Let's look at the long eyes that are greater than 25 millimeters. Far right, the Barrett, 91.7%. The original RBF, 96.9%. Expanded RBF, 98.3%. And these are phenomenal results, not because of me, but because of the, the, uh, the, the RBF formula. And then if you look at just your bread and butter uh, eyes between 2250 and 20 F5, just our normal standard monofocal IOLs, the Barrett is 97.2 in the far right, the original RBF is 96.3, and the expanded RBF is 97.2. So when we look at these numbers at around 95% and, and above, you can understand why we all have an obligation to our patients to get the best possible spherical equivalent. And I would challenge everyone in this room that you don't have to be Warren Hill to get these kinds of results. You need to learn from Warren Hill, what you're doing today, but everybody in this room can do this. Again, all of you can get these exact kinds of uh, results. So I want to encourage all of you to go back to your practices, pay attention to some of these details, look at the new formulas, and get these great results. You owe it to yourself and you owe it to your patients. Thank you very much. Well, we left out one little thing, didn't we? There's this thing called astigmatism. So Adi Abalafi is going to tell us a little bit about how we can find, uh, combine an artificial intelligence approach, the Hill formula, with uh, a torque calculator. Adi? Thank you, Doug. So by now you all heard about uh, the, all what you need to know about the Hill RBF calculator and its prediction accuracy. Uh, however, one should remember that many of our cataract patients will suffer with, from uh, corneal astigmatism as well. Uh, that should be addressed during cataract surgery and preferably with toric IOLs. Now, so what is more obvious than to have an heel RBF toric calculator? Now, um, uh, this calculator should be probably available on the next uh, LensStar update, so uh, I'm really looking uh, for that. Now, toric IOLs are a great uh, solution for patients with pre-existing corneal astigmatism. However, the results following the implantations are not always predictable. And uh, one of the main reasons for that is that standard keratometry and topography machines tend to yield inaccurate results uh, in assessing the net corneal astigmatic power. What they do, they measure the anterior cornea, but they assume that the relationship between the anterior and posterior corneal surfaces are constant, which is not always true. And it has been now five years since Doug Koch had reminded us at the ACRS meeting uh, the role of the posterior cornea in torqueal calculations. And what he and his group uh, found that they, they looked at the posterior corneas of more than 700 eyes using a dull Scheinflug device, and they find that most of the corneas were steep along their vertical meridian. So what does it mean? So if most posterior corneas are steep vertically, and we know that the posterior cornea acts like a negative lens, it means that it creates a net plus power along the horizontal meridian and actually induces against the rule astigmatism. So uh, based on their data, they published the Baylor nomogram, which was the first step solution to address this problem. But since then, a great deal of work has been done to refine our understanding uh, of the posterior corneal astigmatism and to find maybe more accurate ways in how to incorporate it in our daily toric calculations. 
So uh, two main uh, paths has been taken. One is the mathematical models, which actually use anterior corneal uh, based measurements to calculate the net corneal astigmatism and the ultimate goal direct measurements of the posterior cornea now unfortunately as for today it seems like the direct measurements of the posterior cornea are not as accurate as the best mathematical models uh, which serves as holds ups until we'll find better uh, devices that can measure the direct measure directly the posterior uh, cornea and uh, you can probably imagine how uh, happy we were when uh, Warren Hill uh, chose to use our uh, methods of calculation, the Abulafia Koch formula, to be incorporated within uh, the Hill RBF Tori calculator. Now, I would like to tell you uh, a few words about this formula. This is a new formula which is based on a regression model. And it was developed in order to compensate for the posterior corneal astigmatism effect. Now, what it actually does, it takes anterior curvature-based corneal measurements and calculates a new estimated net corneal astigmatism with a new magnitude and a new meridian. Now, we have published this formula in a paper last year in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. And the purpose of this paper was to compare the accuracy of two models of tori Carroll calculators with or without the adjustments of the abulafia Koch formula and to compare those results with the barrett tori calculator. Now, for developing the formula, we use data from the Antal Eye Center in Israel using lens star measurements. And for validating it, we use data from the Lion Eye Institute from WA Australia using the Owl Master 500 measurements. And for the method of calculations, we compared the Alcon and the Holiday Tori calculators with or without the adjustments of the formula and to the Barrett Tori calculator, which has an internal mathematical model for the posterior cornea. And what we found was that there was a high correlation between the X and Y component of the measured corneal astigmatism and the estimated net corneal astigmatism. And although we tried several sophisticated models, it seems like a simple linear regression uh, was the most accurate, uh, at least in our data set. So when we looked at the validated group, so uh, we saw that uh, uh, both the Alcon and the Holiday Tori calculators yielded against the rule errors in predicted residual astigmatism with a centroid of more than 0.5 diopters. However, these results were fixed by the uh, regression formula with the centroid prediction errors reduced almost to zero, shifting all these prediction errors to the center, and the results were similar to those of the barrett tori calculator. So uh, our conclusion was that the prediction of uh, post-operative astigmatic outcomes can be optimized by adjusting standard toric IOL calculators with the new formula. Now I would like to show you one example of one of my patients uh, and to see how, how it works. So this is a 50-year-old uh, female. She had cataract with pre-existing with the rural corneal astigmatism, and I'm lucky to have all these measurements in my office. And let's, let's go and do the calculations together. So we look at the marrings, they look good, and we validate that we are dealing with a symmetrical and regular astigmatism. And then uh, we should follow Warren Hill's methodology and to use primary and secondary supporting instrument in order to determine the steep meridian, and then to follow the same process for the power difference between the meridians and make sure that our primary instrument is aligned with the validated uh, uh, steep meridian. So let's look uh, at the holiday tori calculator. If we use that, we would probably pick a T5 lens. Uh, the Olsen with the standard tori calculator that is on the lens star would probably pick a T5 as well. However, if we look at the Barrett tori calculator and the Hill RBF tori calculator, we would pick a T4 lens, and this is what I did. She had an uneventful cataract extraction. The final axis was just one degree off. Her post-op refraction was quite good, and she's uh, seeing 2020 uh, unaided. So, and if we look at the errors in the predicted residual astigmatism, we can see that the holiday tori calculator and the Olsen with the standard calculator yielded against the rule prediction errors, which were quite high, whereas the Barrett and the Hill RBF tori calculator yielded uh, minimal prediction errors. And this is how it should look like on uh, the Torque Planner on the new um, LensStar software. So thank you very much.
Okay, so I think we have a little bit of time if for our comments or questions. Uh, I don't know that we have a way for the audience to do that conveniently. Um, so in, in your practice, Steve, how many devices do you measure when you measure somebody's? Uh, Adi talked about measuring three different ways. What, what's your practice in that regard? So our routine is all the measurements are done before the patient sees the doctor. And I use the Lenstar, the OPD, and then uh, we use a Cassini as well, looking at the posterior corneal astigmatism. So I look at those three. Now, if there's any discrepancy, sometimes I'll send them back for other instruments, other testing, but those are the three basic things that go to, for every patient who, before they see me. Mike, and you, I noticed you, you make your decision right there on the fly when you see the patient. So you're looking at the topography, is it, as I understand it, as well as the uh, Lenstar measurements? Yes, and, and in fact, that it's really great for me because I'm actually getting two different measures off of two different mechanisms on the same instrumentation. And I used to also collect uh, different topography information from other units within the organization. Uh, we have a, a ton of stuff at, at CEI to look at, and I found that most of that was really just a waste of time. As I migrated, I just decided that I'm going to use the instrumentation, which gives me the right answers, and I have both a qualitative view to be able to look at the topography, see if it makes sense, and uh, the quantitative view on both the topography component of the T-cone as well as the measurements directly off the uh, Lenstar uh, diodes. And even though it's the same device, it's two separate measurements, which I think is what's so important to understand, so that you have two separate data points to compare. Well, in all fairness, it's not two data points. It's multiple data points which have been merged. The, you know, what, what we're given on the printout is recognizing that there are numerous data points that are collected that are all overlapping and getting the same measures within a very tight tolerance. One of the nice things about the Lenstar unit for me is that if there is an outlier data point, it will flag that and my team will look at the data point and, and if it was not uh, a well-captured image, it will extract that, remove that piece of data, and with the Lenstar, I can actually take out one piece of the data set and add in an additional piece without running all of the additional uh, studies in advance. That can be particularly challenging if you have patients that uh, have ocular surface issues or they can't hold still very well. If you have four good measures and a couple measures that the patient moved a little bit for and they're not as good, with this particular instrumentation, unlike some of the others, uh, we can actually just remove the bad data points and replace them without getting rid of the good data points. And one of the other nice aspects of it is you can actually look at the reflected mires and actually look at the true raw data and you can tell right away that that's a bad measurement or a smeared point that tells you there's something amiss in addition to the numbers that you pointed out. Warren, how many, how many uh, different measurements do you get? Well, to, to go on top of what Mike said, uh, one of the real advantages of the Lenstar is that you have access to every single aspect of the measurement. So when you have five or six axial measurements, you can actually see where the calipers are, you can adjust them, and if something doesn't look right, you can delete and repeat. And just to emphasize another point, we use validation criteria. So a measurement is only as good as our ability to know what it means. And if our, my staff looks at each and every one of the measurements, and if it doesn't meet validation criteria, they delete and repeat it. Not only do you have access to the reflective keratometry, you actually have an image, but the axial length, the white-to-white -white measurement, I mean, you can see absolutely everything. Instead of just looking at numbers on a screen, you can actually see how the measurement was done. For the white-to-white, -white, for instance, um, we use that for sizing for an ACI well if you need to. You can actually take a caliper and move it in or out and move it up, down, all around and get the white-to-white -white exactly correct. So you're not just stuck with the number you're given. You have the ability to modify things and change things. And if you can't resolve it towards um, validation criteria, then you delete and repeat. And this is just a wonderful way to get good measurements. So Warren, when, when I get a result that indicates it's out of bounds, do I ignore it and use another formula, or do I use it but use it with a grain of salt? Well, right now, the recommendation is if you have an out-of-bounds calculation, you don't use it. And I, I recommend that people use Barrett and RBF. You saw how, how close they are. These are two, 
the two most accurate methodologies. And one of the great things about the Lenstar is it has them. And you can set up your printout so that it has Olson, Barrett, RBF, and perhaps Haggis, whatever you want to look at, and look at them all side by side. But my recommendations is that if you have an out-of-bounds indication, the formula is telling you, don't use me for this because I don't really have the data to support that calculation. And I, use, I would use Barrett instead. Although it's remarkable how often the out-of-bounds calculation really is very close to the to what my other two that I use when I have them lined up are the Barrett and the Holiday One. It's, so it's very close, but again, I don't I don't have the the data to support it. Now with this new version that'll be out with the calculator in August and out on the Lenstar in October, the number of out-of-bounds points you're going to see is going to drop almost to zero. It's so will we have the the extended version? Uh, you said on the Lenstar itself in October. Is that correct? Right? October. In, how about the uh, the Ablafia Coke as well? When is that going to be available? Adi, I think that's going to be October, right? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be in October. So everything you're seeing today will be part of the next Lenstar software cycle that'll be ready to download in October. Okay. Well, thank you. I think we've. Uh, I hope uh, you've enjoyed the session. Again, I want to thank Hogstreit for uh, for sponsoring this, for giving us the opportunity to share this with you, and uh, have a great afternoon. Enjoy the meeting, everybody. Thank you.